Since I'm flattered to be here, is all of you know how difficult it is to build a tall building and how to create a skyline. That it's not just the image that's on a com computer screen or in an architectural monograph or in a newspaper, but it's these incredibly detailed, very deep, complicated structures. And inevitably, and Fred Clark touched on this in one of his um, conversations, inevitably there's kind of a search for the newest and for the innovation and what is breaking a boundary and who's the cool architect that's in Time Magazine's influential list and everything. And it's easy to kind of get absorbed by the future and you know, the promise of the future and the controversies of the present. And so I wanted to add just a little bit of um, context before my talk and actually dipped into a real interesting book that came out a few years ago. It's called Skyscraper, The Search for American Style, 1891 to 1941, a collection of articles from architectural record from when they appear. And it's fascinating if you go back and kind of skim through it. You, know, you have to kind of update it. All architects are not men. All, sky, all skyscrapers are not American. But a lot of the points I want to just kind of real quickly, I want to just read three excerpts real quickly because it, it kind of resonated. The first is from a writer, R. Ferry, in 1904. It is more than right to insist on the artistic conception of the high building. Engineers will doubtless maintain that the chief problem is that of engineering. I am not in the least disposed to discount the importance of the engineering problems, but I respectfully submit that in a building that covers a considerable area, that raises its head as high into the upper strata of the air as the engineers will carry it, the artistic expression, form, covering, and outer aspects of supreme public importance. The second one I want to read, and you students all feel like, my God, I wandered back into the lecture. What am I doing here? <laughs> uh, the second one I want to read is from a writer, Alfred Hoyt Granger, in 1905. There are but three absolutely essential qualities in a great architect. And they are good taste, poetry, and common sense. And the, qual and the measure of the greatness lies in the balance of these three. And the final quote, I want to read this. This is from Lewis Sullivan, who I think most of you should know the name of, from Chicago. And this is uh, from 1901. Architecture is not merely an art. It is a social manifestation. We must, we must look to the people, for our buildings as a whole are an image of our people as a whole. The crucial study of architecture becomes a study of the social conditions producing it. And the reason I wanted to read those is I think they strike on something that we need to remember at a conference like this. And that is that for all the changes and advances in technology, all the globalization, the basic fundamental challenge of architecture and urban design and cities has not changed. And that is, how do tall buildings fit in not only to the economic pro forma, or the skyline, or the technological possibilities, but our social and cultural landscapes? How do we create icons that aren't sim that are symbols, positive symbols, rather than symbols of excess? And I think that if anything, this is a question that is more pressing than ever. Buildings are getting taller and taller, even in San Francisco, um, even in cities like New York to some extent, and certainly in growing metropolises in other continents. Not only is the height taller, it's also the sheer number. Uh, in one of the early talks, I, I just thought that 
and I think it was the image of um, Be Beijing just showing, or in Shanghai, just showing the difference in the question of a decade or so, just the sheer agglomeration. And, and any of you who study this or work in the trade, you know how those numbers are growing. But so that with all those developments, each of those are the kind of buildings mm -hmm that an architectural writer, architectural record writer in the early 20th century would not have been able to comprehend. If you go through the early chapters of the book, people are marveling at the idea that there might be a 12-story building and then a 20-story building. And, you know, again, you all know this better than I do now, how things would get pushed to. So, in, you know, how Today, would someone kind of used to early cities relate to these towers where the ornamentation is little more than glass or metal, and the rhythms and the forms bear little resemblance to the punched window orders of an earlier tower or the tripartite shaft, and you've got the base, you've got the shaft, you've got the cornice, and the, you know, that's the thing you do. And Oh, there we go. Should have gotten organized before. <laughs> and the thing is, is that, you know, what I'm talking about might sound like kind of the dim past, and, and some of the comments today touched on these new eras ahead and new ways of living in the city, and certainly something like this, you know, a, 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 something as basic as a smartphone, it reshapes the whole notion of what is design, what, you know, what are the physical embodiments of a culture. But the fact is, a lot of regular people are kind of spooked by what they see. You know, a building can look real cool in design, or it can win an Archetizer Award, and you know, it can just set the blogs aflame. But a lot of everyday residents in cities just kind of get a chilly feeling from it. It just seems like too much. And I certainly see this in San Francisco. I think a lot of what's happening downtown is great, just in terms of the density, the kind of issues we talked about. And I, I take art to work, so I don't have to drive, which is a true lesson. I just have to stand up now on art and you know, complain about that. Um, but it, you know, a lot of a lot of people, no matter what cool tools they have in their pocket or how much they love wireless connections and things like that, the notion of place, and even if they love to travel and fly, you know, we, we live in these worlds that on the one hand we're increasingly atomized and global, but the whole notion of local authenticity just has become such a buzzword and such a kind of visceral sense. And so to a lot of people, it's like you look at a city like San Francisco, and the physical change to the skyline is something unmatched probably since the late 60s, early 70s. It's essentially a new form of the city. And for a lot of people who are dealing with enough uncertainty in their lives, they don't need more uncertainty. They see this stuff going up, and it just feels wrong. And San Francisco has its own odd personality quirks, but I think to some extent this plays out in a lot of other cities. And so a lot of the challenge, I think, as architects, as engineers, create, you know, get the tools to do ever more things. And as the environmental imperative gets ever stronger, the kind of how far can we go, how tall can we go, how dense can we get, things like that. At the same time, I think it's a real challenge to remember that what you are building is the landscape that people live in. And so what I want to do, and you know, this is a talk that is free of slides, it's free of PowerPoint, it's everybody on either side of me has super cool images. Um, so I'm just kind of like leaving those be. I just want to make a few real simple points and then um, go over to questions. But it's almost like just kind of three reminders you might carry in your head, whether it's sitting down with a client or you know figuring out a neighborhood plan or 
thinking about how to streamline a building and make it a little more efficient and a little more this and a little more that. And the first thing I just want to mention is to remember, and this is more to the practitioners in the crowd or the students who aspire to be practitioners in the crowd, just remember that the community you design for isn't simply the roster of tenants and residents that are inside the building. Uh, I think that John's presentation this morning touched on this real well. Renee made some great comments about this, and it was interesting, Fred, who's working at a big scale, talking about how to humanize that. But the fact is, is that what you are designing becomes part of people's lives who may never go inside the building, who may never, certainly never pay a lease to be in there or whatever. You are shaping how they look at their city. You are shaping how they navigate the streets of the city. Maybe you're creating spaces for them to use. Maybe you're closing off vistas and closing off passageways that they had seen as part of their city. It's almost a, a kind of an emotional trauma. But it's also, when I talk about kind of the community thing, I think that is probably really, I'm not a, I, I'm not a trained architect. I don't even look like one. Uh, but, you know, I suspect that's a difficult thing to do when you're sitting down with the client, you're sitting down with the developer, you're sitting down with the engineer and the cost consultants trying to make the, you know, make everything pencil out. Or you're sitting down with the planners who just want a certain checklist of things. But the fact is, is that the decisions that are made about a specific building to make it work a little better or make it come in a little bit less expensively, they ripple out into the life of the city and they remain. And, I, and the example I would use, I'm not going to use the building's name, but one of the towers that went up in San Francisco in the last decade or so, 10 or 12 years, uh, it was in the works for several years. I mean, I, I don't mean just in the works, every tower is, but it kind of was in that weird limbo that any veteran architect knows. And it started out as a hotel and housing, and then it became a hotel and housing with an office wing, and then it became an economy hotel in the office wing, all residential, and then it turned in eventually to all residential. And it kept getting moved around and redone. And the tower got built, and in a lot of ways, it's really attractive. It's one of the better towers that have gone up in San Francisco during the new century. But the second floor of the tower is where all the ventilation equipment is. So you've got a ground floor that's not particularly high. Then you've just got this wall of ventilation stuff. And then you've got this gorgeous object that streaks up to the heavens. And I kind of politely asked the architect about it when it was done, because it just, it looks deadly on the street. It kind of kills the corner. There is now a tenant in the corner, but, you know, it's, a, it's probably a bank with about four clients who are very high net worth, so they don't need traffic from the sidewalk. And at some point, when it went from being hotel and residential to just being residential, before the, the kind of the ventilation stuff, my technical term, had been in between the two uses. Once it became all residential, kind of the easiest thing to do was to just drop it down. And by then, it was a building that had been four or five years in limbo. Everybody just wanted to get it built. They wanted to make the money work. And the architect admitted that once it was done, it, it just, to him, it was like, oh, we kind of dropped the ball on that. And I understand that. We all make mistakes in our job. But if your job is building a 50 or 60 story tower on a major corner, you just remarked how the city is. So that the first thing is just, no matter how many pressures say otherwise, don't forget that you're designing for the community beyond the people in and out of the building. The second point I want to make is, Anything that can be done, I think, is of value if there are elements that people can relate, relate to that pay dividends long term. 
And the reason I say that is that there, and, and Fred touched on this in another moment, there is such an emphasis on newness and the cool new building and the cool new innovation and the cool new architect. And it, it, I think particularly in the world of social media and the internet, you know, things just percolate around so much more quickly than they ever did. It's interesting to talk to older architects and you know, lovers of urban design in cities who just talk about, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, there were the cool little magazines published in New York, and those things were the conduit for ideas. Now it's just this blitz on the internet. But again, the if a building is to be an icon, if it is to be a cherished part of a city that in turn makes those civic citizens more open to future big buildings, it needs to just be something enduring and rewarding to people. Um, Renee talked about this a little bit. Would she just, I mean, she wasn't talking about high rises, but just how too many buildings today don't kind of cop capture the rich and complex way that we live in cities. And I think that that's a real interesting comment. I and mean, if you go back to the 20s, you look at the, the big buildings, obviously the Chrysler Building or whatever, San Francisco, uh, the Rust Building, the Shell Building, uh, the Telephone Building. Those were very big buildings for the time. They were not seen as outrageous. And if you look at them now, there's just such a richness of material. You know, it's the terracotta pressed in crazy Mayan, pattern, Mayan patterns or jazz age motifs. You know, the Chrysler building, how many hubcaps can you see in it? Things like that. Uh, the Shell building, which SOM used to be in. You know, if you look up at the cornice, the medallions are pressed shell. Uh, and then the thing about things like that is they give a texture to the city. And I'm not arguing you should all become postmodernists. I'm not saying glass should be banned. Um, though I often think that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> but I like the occasional glass building, but it's definitely um, scene number one. You're not just developing for the builder who said, you're not just designing for the builder who says, I want a cool glass building. It looks now. Uh, but it was interesting, like when Michael showed the images of the Agile Tower in uh, China, how the uh, sunscreens on the outer facade and just kind of the texture of it was coordinated to the sun patterns, so that you had this kind of subtle, interesting texture rippling up and down it, totally of the moment but at the same time, something that just adds a little bit extra. Um, and, and that little bit extra can kind of take all forms. I mean, San Francisco, it's, um, it's been building it, for another year until Fred takes it away, is the Transamerica Pyramid. The Transamerica Pyramid is hugely controversial. It would not have gotten built today. It did get built, and it's now an icon, but it, there's that transition period before it became an icon, and part of it was that the public space is this real simple grove of redwoods next to it. That was an idea: is like we're going to bring we're going to bring the redwoods into the city, and that little touch was the humanizing element that kind of helped bring people around on the Transamerica Pyramid, you know, beyond the skyline form, things like that. And, and so again, the point I would just make is like, these buildings just can't perform super well. They just can't look super great on a screen that has the right aspect ratio going on. Uh, you know, they, they need to just kind of reward people so that even if I don't live in the big building, even if I'm not a big building kind of guy, I kind of like that one. It's, it's an odd little twist, but it's, it's the difference between the it's too much, our city's being destroyed, and, well, I wouldn't do it myself, but it is kind of cool. And the last point I want to make is that your tower is not a thing unto itself. And certainly, I think this is a theme throughout today and throughout the trade now, which is terrific. 
sustainability, more and more people are really thinking, if we're building big buildings, how do we make them perform well? How do we, you know, keep the sustainability as high as we can? You know, things like that are so important because I realize this isn't just a sculptural object. It's not a thing unto itself. It's part of a larger whole. But that's also true of the urban district. And again, we have lots of talk about that today. The whole notion of density is that these things should fit together and create something greater than themselves, something with a real spark of excitement. And what I want to do is just um, read one other real quick one. And, and the reason I mention this, the reason I'm going back to this, is that this is another, you know, we might think this is just an issue today, but this is a tension that has gone back in architecture as long as the elevator was invented. And this is um, from 1913. Herbert Crowley later found the New Republic, oddly enough. And he wrote about the tall building is the economical building. It renders meaningless all the architectural values upon which the traditional European street architecture has been based. It has been emancipated from paralyzing restrictions and has become a specific and original type dominated by novel, formative, and essentially real practical requirements. The thing about a view like that, which you hear a lot today, is that it leads to a counter-reaction. A lot of the pushback, the reason that cities like San Francisco and Boston and Seattle put in height limits in the 70s and 80s, the reason that downtown growth became such a huge issue is because people recoiled from the idea that, oh my god, I'm building a big building, all bets are off, it's a brave new world. You know, it works great in an Ayn Rand novel and Gregory Peck is the, you know, Howard Rourke thing. In real life, people pushed back. And I think that right now, on the one hand, we've got all these big trends for densification, for urbanization, for verticality. But I do sense the pushback and the concern, particularly in societies where citizens can question and challenge authority, which is very true in San Francisco, or London, or Los Angeles, or New York. You know, everyone in this room can kind of embrace the virtues of density. But to a lot of people, there's the danger of excess, that you're just it's more traffic, it's higher housing prices, these buildings aren't even helping with housing, all the things, it looks weird, it looks strange, it's not the world, and I vote, or and I know how to file a lawsuit, or things like that. And I think we really are, and, and the, I think, if nothing else, a conference like this shows how much the world is changing and how much potential is out there. At the same time, we're not a blank slate. It hasn't gone back to, to the you know, moment one. And in terms of the tension over towers and tall buildings, I mean, some of it is generational, certainly in San Francisco. Some of it does involve taste matters and things like that. But I think that it's also real, and it's something that architects, developers, engineers, planners all have to take into account. I mean, renderings and models and 3D animations are incredibly seductive, but they're also kind of simple. And the real life, what it is that you create, as complex as it is, it's also the most critical element of the project. And so I just want to stop there, and then if there are any questions, terrific. Or if not, we'll, we'll keep the meeting on schedule. Any, any, any questions? That's my little broadside. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I just was curious as to what kind of methods um, a designer could approach to connect the community with a building that they were designing. Yeah, uh, you know, what kind of methods could a designer use to connect, you know, connect people with, connect the community with the building they're designing? 
think part of it, I mean, it does, I mean, that's something about San Francisco. There is the planning that kicks in. It's interesting, there's a neighborhood mission bay that's a redevelopment district. The first, um, the first buildings that were built there on what was supposed to be a main retail street, the whole idea is keep the heights there. So you got a bunch of big buildings built with really crummy ground floor retail spaces that have never done well. The planners then kind of played with the rules enough they didn't have to redo the environmental impact report for the district and said, you can have another five feet if it's on the ground floor. And just that little bit of like the generosity of the ground floor, the things built since then are just kind of more inviting and you're seeing more of a neighborhood thing take form. But I mean, I think that no matter how big a building is, little touches to it can work if it's possible. A good public space in a building can really identify that building it has become something that's part of our city. Um, I'm of an age where I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, but you, you saw in, in New York in the 80s a lot of these big towers go up in Manhattan. Long timers are saying it's the end of the world. They came with really big, dramatic, enclosed public spaces. And there have been privatization issues since then. But at the time, it was something that, like, you know, a 24 year old college graduate who was like working at a department store and freelance writing could go in there, grab a cup of coffee, and get a vicarious thrill out of it. You know, in other words, there are lots of little ways. It's just how it reads on the skyline. How, it, how can you make something that's immense also feel approachable? So that, that would be my kind of long-winded answer. Um, other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Prerogative of the host. You might have read the, the, uh, that article in the New York Times this past weekend by the group called BARF, Bay Area Renters yes. Federation or something. <laughs> that was really kind of from the community. I'm not sure how much of the community they represent, but the renters community and stuff really saying that more housing is needed and, and that article really saying to do that we need taller structures which you know and for the reasons you described there's been hesitation not just in san francisco but coming down the peninsula as well so i wonder if you have kind of a reaction to that yeah the, the article was in the new york times it was pretty much just saying uh, i think a lot of you are from the bay area obviously yeah. the, the cost of housing is insane and uh, so you get people saying we need more housing and we need it put in the center of the city and you get the pushback. The thing about a tall building, a tall building is one thing in downtown San Francisco. It's another thing in downtown Palo Alto. You know, people are going to see tall buildings as tall buildings. It's like how can you have, you know, San Francisco, I don't think economically building a 60-story building, you're going to have a lot of affordable housing, except in the money generated. But you can add a few stories in the neighborhood commercial areas. There's still that pushback. It's like, well, we don't have five-story buildings in our neighborhood. We you know, San Francisco, back in the 70s, slapped 40-foot height limits on a good swath of the city in the commercial districts. Planning put forward a proposal last year that would allow buildings to go up to six or seven stories if they included affordable units. The pushback on that has been pretty much as if all those Chinese towers we saw in the morning are now going to be dropped down at 19th and Terrible in the outer sunset. I mean, it's, it's kind of unmoored to reality, but it's an easy political argument. And I think that's a little of the generational thing. I think people of a certain era want the city to look like <clears throat> how it did when they got here. And that's why a big fight of the towers in the 70s and 80s. I think there's a lot more openness to, I don't care if it's four or eight stories, if it's got bicycle parking, and if the cafe is cool, and if we can get a little housing out of it. But the people who know how to go to the planning commission and the board of supervisors, and file discretionary reviews and things. They're the older people, often, who know how to work the system. And that's, that just plays out over time. So any, any last question? OK, thanks a lot.
very much, John. So we're just going to take a minute or two to pop up the computer again. So maybe just, uh, it's not a break, but you can stretch, refill your uh, water or coffee if you like. But just in a couple of minutes, we're going to resume the afternoon program. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Mm 